So welcome everybody. I'm going to let uh, give us a few minutes for everyone to uh, enter the room. We've got a very busy uh, webinar today. Uh, we're expecting sort of 500 people. And so to find out what everyone's background is, we're going to have an introductory poll. Erin's um, going to tee up a poll. So what is your professional background? The question, the answers are utility, research student, consultancy company, or an instrumentation provider. Uh, we've got a second question there. Uh, when was the first time you heard about digital twins? Uh, more than five years ago, two to five years ago, less than two years ago, or this is a very new subject for you and you've only just about heard about it today and hoping to learn more about it. So give it a couple of more minutes for everyone to settle down and answer the poll. Um, so do answer the poll if you can. And I'll start beginning. So welcome to this webinar. My name is Oliver Griefson. I'm an Associate Director at uh, the Engineering Consultancy Atkins Realis, as well as a visiting professor at the University of Exeter, as well as um, the chair of the IWA Digital Water Programme. I brought this webinar together today to really, let's have a discussion on what digital twins are. And I've got three fantastic panelists um, Pilar Conejos of um, Idrica, who was responsible for the digital twin in Valencia, which really gave me the introduction um, to what a digital twin was. Vim Aldenart of the a AM team, who's a, a fellow um, panelist, uh, uh, panelist on the IWA Digital Water Programme, along with Pilar. Um, and he's a absolute master of uh, digital twins over in Belgium. And of course, uh, without going saying more, James Ballard of Seven Trent Water, where lots of interesting things of digital twins are being brought into practice right now. And I'll let James tell you all about it in a little bit. There are some sort of um, introductions that I have to say. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available online on the IWA Plus uh, Connect Plus platform, the IWA Network website, as well as I'm sure get shared on all sorts of social media as well. Uh, the speakers are responsible for securing their own copyright permissions for any work that they will present, of which they are not the legal copyright holder. And the opinions, hypothesis, conclusions or recommendations contained in the presentations and other materials are the sole responsibility of the speaker and don't necessarily reflect the IWA opinion. And they may well, of course, be their own personal opinions as well. So those are the sort of things I have to say. Uh, for the webinar, there is a chat box. So do use the chat box. There is also a Q&A box that the... Um, the presenters will be using to answer your Q&A questions. There is a Q&A session at the end. All attendees' microphones will be muted um, and raising hands don't bother because we can't look at it. There are 221 people in there in the webinar right now. Um, I'm going to be moderating today. As I said, Pilar, Vim and James are going to be speaking and we've got a really, really interesting 40 minutes to an hour ahead of us. So our first speaker is Pilar Conejos. And I would say about five or six years ago, maybe a little bit more, I thought, what's this digital twin nonsense? And I wasn't convinced on it. And I'd had conversations at various conferences. And it was only when I went to see the work that Pilar did at Global Omnium, uh, where she worked at the time, before she moved over to Idrica, that it, that light bulb moment came over my head and I went, wow, so this is what a digital twin is and this is what it can do. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Pilar Conejos of uh, Idrica. Uh, Pilar is the digital twin manager at uh, Idrica and she is has been working on digital twins for a lot longer than, guess what, the name digital twin existed. So Pilar, do you want to take it away? So thanks, Oliver for your kind introduction. And thank you all uh, for attending uh, this webinar. I'm going to speak today uh, about uh, digital twins for water distribution networks. And 
in my presentation, first of all, uh, I will start with a, a quick introduction about uh, the concept of digital twin and how can uh, be applied to a water distribution network. Uh, next, uh, we'll see a real case example of application of this solution or technology. Uh, and finally, I'll speak something about uh, the future and the potential of digital twins. So, uh, I'll start with the definition of a digital twin. Uh, really, there are a lot of definitions uh, of digital twins, but uh, one that I like the most is this definition that we can see in the, in the slide. Uh, a digital twin is a virtual copy of a real system that represents its behavior continuously and serves as basis for experimentation. That means that uh, we can try new ideas or new changes in the virtual system before making the decision in the real system. And so um, this is the way that we can minimize uh, risk, time, and finally, uh, costs. And here in the definition, I think we can see the key thing that make a uh, different uh, a digital twin from other solutions. And is the capability uh, to reproduce continuously the behavior. And this is the reason why we are going to need a simulation model when we build uh, a digital twin. So the concept of the digital twin was uh, consolidated by Dr. Grips in 2003. Uh, and it was first applied to the industry field. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, it can be applied in a city management context and uh, specifically to a water distribution network. It's true that uh, today uh, most of the deployments uh, are in the industry field because it was, a it was first applied to this sector. But now uh, we are seeing like some early, early adopters in the, in the water sector. And uh, also, the, really the expectations are high because according to this research, uh, digital twin implementations are going to increase by 36% uh, in the coming years in all the sectors. And also, there is an increasing interest in developing uh, hydraulic models. For example, according to this graph, in 2027, the investment of hydraulic models, water and with water, uh, is going to be the double than in 2020. 20. So I think this is closely related to the interest on developing digital twins for, for water distribution network, because uh, as we are going to see later, most of them use hydraulic models as simulation models. But first of all, uh, now we, we, we know the concept of digital twin, by, but why developing digital twin for water distribution networks? Uh, we all know that uh, water networks are complex systems, uh, thousands of kilometers in length interconnected. Uh, they work in a variable environment where things can change uh, suddenly. Uh, and climate change and water scarcity impacts directly uh, in these systems, and they are an essential service. So we have to provide uh, water 24 hours. So uh, there is a strong need to manage these uh, systems in a, in a resilient, uh, in an efficient, and secure way. And digital twins can help us a lot uh, to do it because according to the definition with a digital twin, we can uh, monitor the whole system. Uh, we can analyze its behavior. Uh, we can simulate also the behavior of the system under other conditions. And finally, we can have the necessary insights to improve the real system uh, because in the end, uh, this is the goal, the goal improve uh, the physical and real system. For developing a digital twin, uh, we need some components, and here we can see the three main components that uh, we need. First of all, we need data and real data. We need models also, because as I said before, a digital twin has to simulate the behavior of the network. So we need uh, models to reproduce this behavior. Uh, and finally, we need analytics in order to have the necessary insights to improve uh, the physical system. Let's see uh, the three components. Regarding data, uh, I think uh, today uh, most of the utilities have uh, the necessary data because most of them or some of them have um, different sources of data like DIS, sensors, SCADIA, even smart meters or computerized management, man maintenance management systems. Uh, it doesn't mean that we are going to need the first time that we deploy a digital twin all the sources of data. Uh, there are some that are absolutely necessary and the others, it's good to, to have it, but if we don't have it, uh, at first, 
uh, it doesn't mind we can like ingesting and ingesting more data after that. Regarding models, we have two kind of models uh, that we can use. Uh, we have uh, data driven models based on AI, uh, uh, machine learning, and so on, and we can have physics based models. In the case of water distribution networks, physics based models like actually models, uh, I think work very well uh, to reproduce the behavior of the network because, in fact, we have been using them for a long time. But it's true that we have used uh, these models for, for planning the network. So these models we know, these hydraulic models we know that uh, are a simplification of the, of, the, of the reality. So for these models to be part of a digital twin, have to accomplish uh, several things, like they have to be accurately developed, they have to be calibrated, and they have to be uh, continuously updated. So these models have to um, be able to represent continuously the behavior of the network. And this is the, the reason why we have to connect these models, these traditional models, with real data in order to keep them uh, updated with the real conditions. And here in this slide, we can see the differences between having a traditional hydraulic model that we have, be, we have uh, used for planning uh, or having a hydraulic model connected with the real data uh, to be part of a digital twin. In the traditional way, we, we are used uh, to developing a hydraulic model uh, taking some specific data set in order to reproduce a specific situation then, of the network, like the current situation. Finally, uh, we achieve, we take this data, we calibrate the model, and we can achieve uh, to reproduce the current situation with uh, a high accuracy. But what happens since then? That a lot of changes uh, can happen in the, in the network, like assets up to service, new assets, new set, set points, and so on. And if this model is not updated, the level of calibration uh, starts to be lower and lower and lower, and is not able to reproduce uh, the current conditions of the network. If we connect this model with the data, what we can do is to maintain the level of calibration or the accuracy of this model because it can reproduce uh, all the changes that happen in the network. And finally, we need analytics. We have to uh, add uh, on the top uh, some algorithms so that using the info, uh, the data provided by sensors and also provided by the hydraulic model, we can have the necessary insights in order to make decisions in the real system. And here we can have like different level of maturities of digital twin. We can have a descriptive digital twin to reproduce the behavior of the network. Uh, we can uh, go forward and have a digital twin that uh, is able to make diagnosis in order to answer questions like why things are happening. We, we can improve and having a, 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 a going forward and we can have a predictive uh, digital twin to tell us what is likely to happen in the future. And finally, uh, we can have a prescriptive digital twin that uh, tell us directly uh, the actions that we have to take uh, at any time. So regarding water distribution networks, uh, we can use uh, the digital twin for making decisions for different uh, objectives. We can use the digital twin for planning in order to uh, have an optimal network design. And we can also use the digital twin uh, for supporting our daily operations, like anomaly detections, early response to emergencies, energy optimization, lake location, and so on. So we can cover a lot of objectives uh, regarding water distribution networks. And now uh, we know what a digital twin is, and we know what a digital twin is not. That is also something important. A digital twin is much more than a monitoring, a monitoring system like SCADA. Uh, it's much more than a digital representation like a GIS or a BIM, or it's much more than a hydraulic model built with a static data set. And now uh, we are going to see a real case example of application uh, of a digital twin for a water distribution network. In this case, it's Valencia's digital twin. This digital twin has been supporting the daily operation for over 15 years, so it has been really <laughs> a long journey, and we have really a great experience on oper operating it. Um, really, we, we started very early because we came up uh, very early with, with the idea uh, of connecting the hydraulic model with the SCADIA in order to run simulations in real time. In fact, preparing this, preparing this uh, webinar, uh, 
uh, I found that uh, in 2006, uh, we published our first uh, paper uh, speaking about that. Since then, we have been uh, working and working in order to improve that idea until achieve our uh, current situation where we have our today's digital twin. And I think the key of our success has been uh, the combination of different stakeholders like research, uh, utility knowledge, and also digitalization. But why do we start so early? Because we have been operating this digital team for 15 years, as I, as I uh, said before. Because at that time, we had several challenges to face in the water distribution network, like um, water scarcity, population growth, infrastructures near the maximum capacity, and also keep people in the company uh, near the retirement age. So we realized that we needed a system or a platform that could help us to make decisions, to plan the new infrastructure, to um, uh, improve our decision-making process in the day-to-day -day operation, overall under emergency conditions, and also to make easier the, gener the generational change. And here we can see like uh, three key dates for us that were really important. In 2007, we achieved the connection of the hydraulic model with Skidia. In 2012, we started the digitalization process of journey in the company, so much more sensors were deployed and applications. And in 2018, uh, we moved uh, into a smart or data-centric platform where we integrated all the info and connected with the hydraulic model in order to have our today's digital twin. And here we can see like the main figures of our digital twin. Our digital twin in Valencia, it has 900 kilometers in length. It contains all the regulating elements, pumps, tanks, and valves, and is connected in real time with 600 sensors, uh, pressures, and flow meters mainly. And as a result, with these 600 sensors, we are uh, calculating or simulating what's happening in 10,000 points of the network in real time. They are called like virtual sensors, soft, soft sensors, and this is something great because we know what happens everywhere in 10,000 points of the network, monitoring only uh, or having sensors only in 600 cent points. And this is the reason why we say that with a digital twin, we can, uh, we can know what happens when we are not measuring. Here we can see the main uses uh, so far in the daily operation. It has been really useful because we can run, uh, the, or we can run simulations in real time at any past time under the current situation or conditions and any other what if scenarios. We can also forecast and simulate the behavior for the next 24 hours. And really, uh, these capabilities have been really useful uh, for us uh, to help us to make decisions under emergency conditions. And also, as I said before, to estimate uh, values at not meeting points because with 600 sensors, we know what happened in 10,000 points of the network. And regarding planning, it has been really in, very useful and we have planned all the new infrastructures because with this digital twin, we, can, uh, we have assessed the network requirements, we have designed the new uh, infrastructures, we have defined the behavior and, and very important, we have determined the commission and the stages in order to affect as uh, fewer people as possible. And this is where we are. And now, um, what's next? Uh, we think that, uh, and I think that a digital twin is a journey uh, full of opportunities. It's true that there are several challenges that we have to face, like, for example, the definition of a clear business uh, or or some objectives. Uh, we have seen that a digital twin can be used for different objectives, but it's very important to start focusing on, focusing on some of them. We have to see what our challenges are, and we have to start uh, developing the digital twin focus on these objectives. And after that, we can make it grow, adding and adding much, a lot of objectives, or much more objectives. Another challenge is the development of and calibration of a, of a hydraulic model that runs in real time. This is not something, <laughs> something easy. Uh, another another uh, challenge is the data size and quality. Most of the utilities have uh, data and have different sizes of data, but it resides in different silos and it's difficult to have access to it. And a digital twin has to concentrate and put under the same umbrella uh, all the data. So we have to have access to all of, all, all of them. And finally, people engagement and adoption of this new technology. In the end, uh, digital twin is a new way of working. Uh, it's very important to have people uh, to, 
it's very important for us that people adopt uh, this technology since the beginning. Regarding lessons learned, uh, I think Digital Twin is uh, a tool that empowers and enriches people's work. Uh, implementing a Digital Twin really requires a new innovative culture. Uh, as I said before, data quality uh, is key. So not only uh, this is a challenge uh, that the data resides in different silos, but also it's a challenge to maintain this quality. So we think that it's very important to preserve it from the source. So very important to have a good selection of sensors, good maintenance of sensors, good protocols for registering info. And after that, uh, we are going to need data clean algorithms, but they are the last option. So very important if we can uh, preserve the quality from the source. And after that, finally, keep it simple and focus on your main challenges. As digital twin can be used for a lot of objectives, but we have to start with some of them. Regarding the future, uh, I think in the future uh, we'll, can, we'll see uh, different digital twins interconnected. I have uh, spoken in this presentation about digital twins for water distribution network, but I think uh, we can develop a digital twin for every phase of the water cycle. And they could be interconnected because the outputs of some of them are the inputs for the others. Uh, even we can integrate a digital twin in a smart city context uh, where, for example, in a, in a smart city, every infrastructure will have their own digital twin and they will be interconnected. So we would have like the uh, holistic vision of the behavior of the system. And we could also give an active role to the citizens. And um, also, uh, integrating a digital twin in a, a smart city uh, can bring us a lot of benefits for the uh, water digital twin on itself because we can open like a two-way communication channel between citizens and the utility. Citizens can make a more responsible use of water because they can have access uh, to their consumption and they can see uh, the impact of their actions. Uh, and finally, we can adapt infrastructures to the need of the city if this digital twin, if this water digital twin is integrated in the smart city. And finally, I think digital twins have reached the water sector to stay. Uh, develop and maintain life a digital twin of a water distribution network today is an objective for most of the utilities. And the good news is that data and tools available nowadays make it possible. So this is the reason why I think the best uh, is yet to come because this is a journey full of opportunities. So thank you all for your attention. So thank you, Pilar. That was absolutely wonderful and so much information in such a short time. Uh, we do have some questions in the chat, but I'm going to let you handle them as we go along. Um, so there's some, some of the Q&A. If you're putting the questions in the chat, we can't actually answer them in, in the chat. So do put them in the Q&A, not the chat box. Um, and I think we'll move on. Thank you very much for that, Pilar. And there'll be more um, questions uh, questions to be done in the Q&A section at the end. Our next speaker is Vim Aldenart, who uh, did the most wonderful keynote speech at the Digital Water Summit last November. For those of you who like the world of digital, um, do come to the next Digital Water Summit, which will be in November. Um, and certainly back then, back in November, Vim talked about not only being um, technology ready, but also being market ready, which is something I've seen many, many times over, over the past 20 years of being in the water industry. Vim Altnart, um runs uh, a company called AM Team over in Belgium, um, helping people with digital twins and their application uh, around the world. He's the CEO and co-founder, as well as being on the Digital Water Programme Steering Committee. And it's always got a very, very lively, um, and lots to say. So I'll let Vim take over and um, see what we'll see over the next 15, 20 minutes for the application of digital twins to the treatment side. Vim, do you want to take over? Sure. Thanks, Oliver, for this introduction. Um, also, yeah, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, how great is it to see how much attention Digital Twins gets? Um, and we heard from Pillar, they are here to stay. Well, actually, we also believe they are here to stay. Um, and uh, the coming decade is very promising. We will see a lot of things happening. Um, 
So what we have not seen happening too much up until now is digital twins at the treatment site. So I mean within the fence of a of a water, a drinking water treatment plant or a wastewater treatment plant or a reuse treatment plant. Um, while actually the potential, if you think of it, is huge. Uh, a very mature area Pillar has, has been highlighting, which is digital twins at the network sites. And in my presentation, I really want to bring us to the treatment sites and uh, show a couple of examples uh, there and what digital twins can do. Um, good, let's look at uh, the, the hype or let's say a fraction of the hype, the reality of it. Um, this is the, what this plot is showing is the use of the phrase digital twin as function of time. Uh, and you can see from 2014, uh, uh, something happened. So 10 years ago, people literally started talking a lot about digital twins. It also came with, uh, you know, the rise of artificial intelligence and, and it coincided with a couple of things. Uh, but you can see something is happening, right? This is more than exponential. This is like almost a vertical curve. Um, so th this is the use of the word on the internet and books as function of time. Now, the, the real question is, how will this translate to adoption in the water industry? Because this is digital twins all over the place in all industries. But the real question is, how will it be applied in the water industry and how will it manifest in value? Okay, so well, let's st uh, first start with why. Why, why are digital twins today a little bit more relevant than let's say 10 years ago uh, well it is driven by of course the availability of tools awareness about ai having very good computers things like that but this is not enough um like also oliver said uh, pushing a technology is not enough you need the needs and these are the mega trends in the water industry i will not go over all of them you can sh screenshot the slide if you want to or, or of course look at the recording but we have really mega challenges coming. Climate is one of them, climate change mitigation, adaptation, um, affluent requirements that get more stringent, the mega trend of reuse, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, another one, a human dimension is the aging of the workforce. So we have a couple of customers that are building a digital twins to improve the process site, but to also store knowledge store knowledge uh, in, in, uh, of, of very experienced people that are about to retire. So many, many needs. Huh? Um, so the value, I believe, will drive the adoption. Um, it is not really the hype or everybody talking about it. It is really proving the value. Um, so, okay, this was the why of digital twins. How can we build them? Uh, the fundamental core of a digital twin is kind of a model, a kind of a model that runs on data data of a plant or a system okay and what is often not very well understood is that there are very big families two big families of models we have the data driven models and most of the people are familiar with the name artificial intelligence or statistical models but not many people are familiar with mechanistic models or at least not at the digital twin side yeah and in between you have hybrid models so the focus of my presentation will be mainly on the mechanistic models. So the uh, turning these into digital twins. Uh, this is kind of a philosophy we try to apply at AM team, uh, the knowledge-based approach. Our first goal is always, okay, to start with the why, what, why would we build a digital twin? Because this creates the business case and I will come back to the business case later. Once you know the why, our philosophy is start with knowledge-driven digital twins as much as you can. If you have mechanistic models to your disposal, and I'm giving one example, the activated sludge models or a lot of chemical models being used in the drinking water field. Well, they can provide value in the short term. Why? Because they have prior knowledge. Yeah. So you can start applying them tomorrow and then, of course, improve them. Uh, but this is a, a step we typically take. And of course, you can nicely complement them with data-driven approaches. Um, in some cases, data-driven first is the way to go. But we try to really uh, give priority to knowledge-based digital twins, because especially this learning dimension is very, very powerful. Yeah. Um, so uh, this brings us to a very first case examples. I will have four case examples. I have chosen to give four case examples, not very in-depth. 
but the goal of these four cases is to give you um, an inspiration on what are the potential applications at the treatment side. So there are two drinking water treatment examples and two wastewater examples. The first one relates to tackling climate change impacts because drinking water, especially surface water treatment plants, but also groundwater, uh, are yeah have, are facing issues when it comes to climate. So this brings us to the Netherlands. This is, uh, let's say, Northwestern Europe. And if we zoom in a little bit uh, in the area of Amsterdam, you have a very big lake, which is called the Isel Lake. And you can see that there are two basins here, two intake basins of drinking water, okay? Now, this is rainy, Netherlands is rainy, Belgium is rainy, but still we have droughts. Our summers are getting drier. So this means the chloride concentrations are also going up drastically. Um, so we built the digital twin of the full plant, uh, not only the intake basins, but also the treatments, the full treatment side, to assess the impact of climate change. So what if the chlorine concentrations, for example, within 10 years would increase to a certain level? What would be the impact on the treatments? And can we take certain steps? So the essential goal of this project was uh, to turn data into information. And information is something you can act upon. Yeah, so we built the virtual world, which has a lot of data coming in. You have a model and the model creates data that you cannot really easily measure or creates future scenarios. And then you have the real world where you use that information to, um, yeah, you, to make better decisions. Okay, so we started with a, with a, with an appro a mechanistic approach. We even did a full 3D modeling of this basin. So this is possible at this scale. These are very huge basins, uh, millions of cubic meters. But you can already see that, for example, the mixing in this basin is not very good. You have kind of a short circuiting from inlet to outlet, and uh, it's not optimal. Now, if you don't know this, it's very hard to build an accurate digital twin. Uh, so you, it's, it's very good to have some mechanistic understanding. So the next thing we did is we built kind of a hydraulic real-time model, uh, taking into account this, um, this reality of mixing. And, uh, and it gave quite a good representation of the data. So the blue dots here are the outgoing chloride concentration. And the orange line is the prediction of the models over, uh, over a five-year time span. Now, if you would neglect these hydraulics, so if you would assume this basin would be very well mixed, you would end up with the gray line. And this uh, is not really a very good representation of the data. So you see, you clearly see that adding mechanistic knowledge can really help us uh, either mechanistic models or even data-driven approaches. Now, what, what, what was the end goal here? Well, to run plenty of scenarios. For example, how long does it take until the chloride concentrations at the outlet change. When should we close the basins? What if we recycle certain streams? Uh, can we reconfigure the intake, things like that? So these were scenarios that were run with the model and actually the model is still being uh, used in real uh, right now. Now, uh, according to the definition, this is not yet a real digital twin because there is not yet a real-time coupling with the real plants. Now, of course, we are building the digital twin. It is already being used, but of course, the next step is the real-time coupling. Yeah. So this is, let's say, a digital twin uh, in progress. A second example uh, in a drinking water treatment plant is um, really on a on a treatment level, maximizing uh, the energy savings and chemical savings, yeah, and and also the effluent quality uh, maximization. This uh, is a, another case in the Netherlands. So we have the Dunea case. Uh, Dunea is a drinking water company uh, in, in Netherlands. At the left, you can see the real world. So it's an advanced treatment that treats surface water and removes uh, chemicals of emerging concern. Yeah, it is a quite a unique process because you have an ozone process with a downstream UV peroxide unit. Uh, it's advanced treatment. But these strains, of course, are being becoming more and more popular. Huh? Uh, to remove mica pollutants or to have reuse going on. So we built a digital twin. That's what you can see on the right. Um, it's running with our model Amazon. So this is a, a chemical model we have been developing. And this, ru uh, this runs in the software Sumo. And we run plenty of scenarios. And then you can, of course, uh, yeah, see how to optimally configure these two uh, treatment steps. Because on one hand, operationally, ozone is more 
uh, cheaper, it's less expensive, and UV peroxide is more expensive in terms of chemical and energy. But both remove different types of components, and ozone has a byproduct issue. So how do you uh, tackle this? Well, if you have the digital twin, you can, of course, try to match the data, and that's what we did. Uh, we built the digital twin. This is five years of bromate data. So bromate is a byproduct of ozonation. You really want to keep below certain levels. Um, so this orange line, without any recalibration of the model, is able to really catch the big dynamics. You can say around day 900, there is some mismatch, but also in that region, uh, they also changed the UV sensor. So it, it can also be a data issue there. But yeah, very happy about this prediction. And same with micropollutants. So these are, let's say, a set of 20 different chemicals. Um, we were qu quite happy how the model could predict individual micropollutants. Okay. So this was the first, let's say, validation and calibration of the model. But then, of course, the most interesting stuff comes, uh, and, and Pillar already mentioned it, it is the scenario capability. It is not only real-time monitoring, but also running scenarios. What if scenarios? For example, what if we would control our ozone dose differently or the UV dose differently? So blue uh, is the dose applied in reality. Uh, sorry, orange is the dose applied in reality, both in the ozone system and the UV system. And if you would uh, do a, a virtual controller, let's say model-based control, you could actually end up with quite significant energy savings. Yeah. Uh, again, this digital twin is not yet being applied in practice, but just during the building phase already, these scenarios already led to operational measures that were already implemented. The next stage, we are still working on that, is bringing it live together with the real plant, and ultimately to have this model indeed optimizing the UV dose in real time, okay? So yeah, this gives you just an idea on, on how these models or digital twins can help you optimizing the interaction between the, uh, the different treatment processes. Um, another interesting feature is the soft sensor feature of a digital twin. So this means you predict what you cannot measure based on what you can measure. I will give you one example, the micropollutants. So these are, these are chemicals with concentrations of nanogram, microgram levels. There is not a sensor that can measure them in real time, but it is really cool if you have a model or a digital twin that can predict them in real time, just based on other data, which is pH, UV transmittance, temperature. So these are things you can measure. Okay, um, so dynamic micropollutant concentrations are uh, typically um, not recorded because grab samples are being taken. Okay, so yeah, very interesting feature here. Now we go to the wastewater fields and uh, we uh, zoom in on uh, the monitoring and the control of an advanced treatment. So in Europe, uh, especially driven by the update of the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive, a lot of micropollutants need to be removed. But not only in Europe, also if you look at the United States or different countries where reuse is going on, turning effluent into drinking water, for example, yeah, you need these chemicals to be removed. So um, together with Waterscope de Dommel, uh, we, we actually built half of the digital twin first. So a twin, as everybody knows, a twin is a baby brother and a baby sister, or you know, you need two, two, two children to have a twin. Well, the virtual twin baby was born first, and the real twin baby was born second. What do I mean with this? Well, we first built the virtual full-scale plant to assess the removal, the performance of the plant, the OPEX, the operational and costs, uh, things like that. And we used existing data from the operational biological treatment plants. So we used existing data from the plants. We fed that to the virtual full-scale plants that full-scale plant was not built yet, okay? It was going to be built. And that virtual plant already gave good predictions or assessments in byproducts, costs, micropollutant removal. In a second stage, the real plant was being designed using the same model, okay? And uh, once it's, it's being commissioned, because right now it is being constructed, the digital twin will be coupled in real time. So then... The second twin baby will be born. We will do a real-time coupling of the pre-existing digital uh, 
um, to win half, let's say, with the real plants. And this is supposed to give then on a very low resolution, very fast um, insights on ozone, chemicals, uh, um, byproducts, etc. So again, things you cannot really measure. In the first phase, we would go to monitoring, so aiding the process operation. And in a second stage, when the, um, the digital twin confidence is being built, we will go to advanced process control. So the model will really, um, let's say, intervene in the process in the real time. Okay, this gives us uh, the final case example in wastewater. Um, it's a, another important topic, it is nitrous oxide emissions. Um, I'm giving kind of an outlook here, what we are going to um, go towards. So generally, we start again with um, a mechanistic understanding of food plants. You can see the top view of this wastewater treatment plant here uh, on the bottom screen. Red indicates high N2O emissions and dark blue is low N2O emissions. What I just wanted to show here is without having this mechanistic understanding, it will be very hard to accurately describe N2O emissions because they are very, very local. They are locally happening in a bioreactor. So this is why we start here. We like to start from mechanistic understanding and then we translate these models again to a digital twin model. So first version again is the offline use and the second stage is the online use. And they can be different versions of the same model, okay? And they also have different purposes. The first one has a plant optimization purpose and an insight and a learning purpose. The second one has more of an operational purpose, yeah? So this is really uh, very promising because the nitrous oxide is, is really causing a lot of emissions. And uh, at the global scale right now, the focus on it is growing dramatically. Uh, in the end, this is where we want to go, eh? models that dynamically predict N2O uh, production or emissions. That's what you can see on the y-axis. In this case, this is the liquid phase concentration as function of time. And then you can uh, test mitigation measures, for example, improving the carbon dosing, improving the aeration, and you can try to get the uh, emissions down in real time. And our aim ultimately here is to use soft censoring as much as possible to keep the process uh, as lean as possible. Okay, I know I, I didn't go too deep in the cases, but I just wanted to give you um, a good overview of the, of the different applications at the treatment side. This brings us to the conclusion. Uh, we like to call it uh, what we focus on, the 5E framework. Um, typically, people are focusing on the operational sides. OK, let's improve the affluent quality. Let's, Im let's improve the processes efficiency, lower the costs, for example, lower the emissions. But I think, and uh, we should not underestimate the human dimension in the future. I see people in the future using way more tools, way more new tools themselves which will lead to a, a very yeah, very drastic shift in, in how we do things. So as educational tools or enablement tools or planning tools, digital ones will have drastic value and also at the operational sites um, to, um, to juggle the balls of the affluence, efficiency, and the emissions. Okay, thank you for um, your uh, attention. Huh? So um, if you want to connect with me, feel free to scan this code. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Vim. And very interesting. There are lots, lots of uh, questions in the Q&A for you. Um, so I will let you uh, crack on and start to answer some of those. Our last speaker for today before the um, Q&A session um, is uh, James Ballard from Seven Trent Water. Now, James has been doing a lot on digital twins and IoT and huge amounts on technology for uh, a number of years now. And um, I think James has got some quite interesting things to talk to us about. So, James, I'll let you take over. True. Thank you very much. Right. Shall I wait for control of the slides? Fantastic. Right. So, yes. Hello, everyone. Um, I can't see you all, but I'm imagining there's quite a few. Uh, I think there's around 600. So um, super excited to, to to be here, I guess. And thank you for coming along to listen. Um, 
the previous two sessions uh, is really the kind of inspiration that I've been, uh, you know, reading about and hearing about for the last, at least the last three or four years. Um, I've been in Seven Trend 10 years, uh, and now I'm responsible for the digital twin implementation strategy. So taking this inspiration and, you know, I'm sold. We need them. They are absolutely fundamental to the success of the water sector. We absolutely need them. How, 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 how do we go about deploying these things? So that's what I'm going to talk to you a bit about. Um, but for those that don't know Seven Trent on the call, I'll do a very quick summary of, uh, I guess, the company. So, um, you know, we are one of the largest uh, water companies in, in the UK water sector. Um, we have around about a thousand treatment works. We have 18 large water treatment works. Um, the thousand was the waste treatment works. We've got around about 100,000 kilometers of sewer pipes. We've got 50,000 water pipes. Uh, or what else have we got? Oh, yes. And we're also one of the largest, large, yeah, one of the oldest uh, water companies as well in the UK. So um, if you think about uh, when the infrastructure was put in, um, Birmingham, one of the large cities in, in, the, in, the, in the Midlands, um, a lot of the infrastructure was put in in around 1876. So we are, you know, we have some, we have some old stuff that we have to work with, and that all forms part of the challenge of how do we deploy um, digital twins. So, a couple of the key themes that I wanted to bring out, I guess, over the next ten to fifteen minutes. Uh, you've heard uh, some of this already. So we've talked about mechanistic versus data driven from WIM. And um, I'm gonna bring it up again, because this is one of the key questions that we have to answer when thinking about deploying it. Um, insights, how far can we go? So do we start small? Do we build out? Do you go for everything? Um, data quality, I'm gonna really touch upon data quality because that is absolutely essential. Um, technology stack, we haven't really covered technology stack. So um, I'm gonna say a few words, I guess, on that as well, in the sort of the spirit of how do we make this real? Um, and I'm going to then bring it to life with a couple of examples of what we're doing in Seven Trent um, to really deep dive, I suppose, into digital twins and start to figure them out. So I took this image from the IWA website. I, I actually quite liked it. So it kind of describes the scene. Uh, again, we've had a flavor of this from the previous presentations. You've got your infrastructure, um, be it your pipes or your treatment works. You've got physical sensors. You've then got the data, the, the digital twin. Um, so the data feeding the digital twin and you can have mechanistics or hydraulic based or process based or data driven. So that's where data science comes in. Um, we've then got control systems and we've got users. So um, I'm going to jump to the control systems first of all. So if we think about our treatment works, we've got a lot of control loops going on there. It's quite a complex range of processes. Um, and a control loop for anyone that, that's not familiar with them, think about your, your heating in your house. So as the temperature um, cools down, your thermostat will kick in, it will read the temperature and it will turn on your heating. And then once your house uh, heats up, it will then read the temperature again and then it will turn off the heating. So that is a control loop. That's an on off control loop. Um, and then you get more complex types of control loop. Um, and typically on a, on a site, you can expect to see somewhere around 100 um, control loops. Some of our larger waste treatment plants have up, upwards of 150 control loops all interacting with each other to keep the processes going through from the inlet of the treatment works through uh, all of the processes, primary, secondary, the ASPs that we've heard about, uh, and then throughout to, to, the, to the water course. And of course, similar on the water side, uh, the clean water side. Um, and control loops in general, they're designed to keep processes stable. So they're not already designed to optimize processes. They are there to keep processes stable. We as users want to optimize it because we want to get the most benefits for our customers in the environment. So we absolutely need to be reducing energy. We absolutely need to be improving um, final weapon quality, for example. And we need to be making sure that, that, that we improve our, our impact on society and the environment. So uh, things like greenhouse gases also come into it, like N2O. So they're, they're the key drivers. Question is how? So we think about this, this user sat in a chair down there. Um, we are now asking them to not only deliver the best water, best quality water and drinking water to our customers' taps, we're also uh, and also the best final effluent to, to the rivers. We're asking them to do it for the minimal energy, minimal chemical use, 
Um, net zero emissions is, is one of the drivers I'm going to come on to. So minimal uh, greenhouse gas impact on the environment. Uh, you can see how complex this is starting to become. Um, and that's why we need to start implementing digital twins. It's, it's becoming really, really complex and we need to assist uh, our operations in order for them to help them make the right decisions. Okay, so as a system then, um, what you see in front of you, we want to apply this definitely across um, source to tap. So that is the, the water course um, for us. We're, we're landlocked, so it's not the sea. It's, it's got the rivers through to the tap um, and then from drains to the river um, or, or the sea if you're, if you're one of the other water companies. So that's generally the system that we've, we've got and we want to implement this end to end. So data then. We've talked a bit about data um, and data fundamentally underpins everything. Uh, and the six uh, categories you see above you there, um, this is really how we're thinking about data in, in, in seven trends. So first of all, we need, to we need to know what we've got. So a data catalog is absolutely essential. We need to know our asset data. We need to know um, our telemetry data. We need to know what data we've got, what, where the gaps are. We want to know standards around that data. Um, we need to know absolutely everything about that data, metadata. So data catalog, number one essential. Number two, we need to be able to acquire that data. So if you think about some of the new, um, the new and upcoming IoT type sensing, um, that's really, really good. But how do you then combine that with traditional sensing? So where we've got sensors on, on plants and sites coming through traditional SCADA systems, how can we then also make sure we're ingesting IoT data? And so where does that, where does that play a role? Okay. Analytics and diagnostics. So we've talked about digital twins in the sort of in the simulation world, uh, and we've talked a bit about optimizing. So I'm not going to repeat that. Um, but there's that that bit around analytics and diagnostics. So where do you do all the heavy crunching behind the scenes, and then how do we feed that into the simulations, and then how do we use the simulations to actually optimize the plant? And does that optimization come in the form of recommendations? Does it automatically control our systems? So um, yeah, that's that one. Visualization and reporting. So we've got to think about how everybody from the CEO, so for us, Liv, um, what does she want to see if she wants a, you know, a kind of a real-time view of, of the situation across certain trends, um, all the way through to the field workers. So what do they want to see when they're out and about maintaining our assets? At two in the morning when they've been called out to the middle of the field in the pouring rain, what is it they want to see? What reporting do they want to have? And finally, alerts and alarms. This is a big, big, big topic for me. This is close to my heart. So alarms are very reactive. Historically, we have a lot of alarms. We're always reacting to alarms. So maybe a customer's rang in um, and said, I can see a problem. Um, maybe um, we have a telemetry alarm that, that is triggered and, um, and, and we have a, a network control and our network control have to respond to thousands of alarms every day. What we want to do is feed them proactive information in the form of alerts. So how can we embed this diagram and everything on it in order to provide as much proactive information as possible to reduce the amount of alarms that we get? Bro, right, a couple of requirements, and then I'm gonna go on to, to some use cases. So um, scalability, this is something that's really key that we've got to consider when we start to deploy uh, digital twins on, on our sites and in our networks. How do we make sure that it's scalable? So um, if you think about one use case and one application, and uh, we've heard a couple of them, how do we, how do we, so we've, we've seen the network with Ichika, we've seen the water network, we've seen uh, treatment works with WIM. So we've got to think about how can we make this scalable? Do we have to start again every time we want to apply it to a new site? Or is there uh, a way that we can create an approach such that we can actually scale the majority of the work we've already done through to another, another site um, or another catchment or another water company. Um, so yeah, scalability, baseline performance, calibration and validation. So this is where we've got to start thinking about machine learning and data-driven approaches versus mechanistic. So one of the key things I've seen, I guess, over the last couple of years with the machine learning stuff, it's really, really good and it, it delivers some huge benefits. But one of the key, I guess, benefits we see is that it can detect drift from a baseline. So machine learning techniques can, can, can monitor and can, can identify when, uh, when something's going out of range and drifting out of the norm. Perhaps it's a level in the sewer is drifting out of, out of its normal range. 
Um, but then you've got to question the normal part. So how do we make sure the normal is what you expect it to be in the first place and kind of what the system was designed for in the first place? Normal might not be actually what you want, but it is normal for your operations. So what I'm trying to say is maybe it's rubbish, but it's just normally rubbish. So we kind of need to figure that out. Um, so again, a question of, of how, we, how we combine, and this comes to the combination question of mechanistic and data-driven, and which one do you start with, and then how do you enhance it? Soft sensing, we've touched on that a bit as well. So making sure that you know in the future, we are expecting billions of more data points to, uh, to come into uh, Seven Trent each year. For sure, it's gonna happen, but how do we make sure that we are getting the right data um, and actually where we can start to use soft sensing to reduce the amount of physical sensors we need out there. Because every physical sensor is going to need maintenance, it's going to need calibration, it could produce uh, errorous data. So if we can start to infer and accurately infer some of the data, then brilliant. Less than last we talked about, AIML, well, we talked about the, the machine learning part as part of this. So these are kind of a lot of the considerations we've got for how do we then deploy that on the site. Okay, two examples then. So these are two off what um, winning projects. The first one is going, is, is, it will, well, we won that about two years ago. Um, and that is the AIoT, so Artificial Intelligence of Things. And that is where we are working with around 10 or 11 partners. Um, so some of them are Rockwell, uh, Microsoft, 8Power, uh, and there's many other, University of Exeter, uh, as well as water companies, um, and there are more that I've forgotten to mention, um, and many on the call. Oh, Offwatt, by the way, people. So Offwatt is our regulator. Um, so they hold an innovation competition yearly at the moment, um, and the innovation competition is where um, all the water companies in, in the UK sector, we, we get together to create uh, projects essentially that really push the boundaries. Um, and one of the winning, the winning projects a couple of years ago was, was this AIoT. So briefly, what we wanted to do was to really test artificial intelligence um, and, and therefore obviously it's a data-driven approach. Um, and we want to see how far this could get in order to uh, benefit customers in, in, in the environment with respect to flooding and pollutions. So um, obviously, with, with, with some of the challenges we've got, global climate change, et cetera, we really need to be targeting flooding, uh, pollutions and, and uh, overflow spills as well, of course. Um, and so AI, how can it help us? Well, we are probably about halfway through the project now, I think it's fair to say. Um, and we have created uh, a sort of an AI brain, which is made up of a few data-driven models. Um, one is to predict the inflow into, into the catchment. Uh, the second one is then to simulate how that happens in the catchment. By happens, I mean, how does it flow through the pipes and how does it go from one pumping station to another? Um, which pumping stations, by the way, that's how we push the flow through the waste network. Um, so typically it follows the flow in the middle of the screen here from the customer property, the runoff um, as well, combines, and then uh, we pump it through with, with pumping stations through into the uh, waste streamer works. So, what we wanted to do was optimize uh, pumping stations. So ahead of a storm, how can we that we already have through any storage tanks, through the pumping stations, wet wells themselves? Um, and then during a storm, how can we make sure that, uh, that we're not actually overloading the system? So typically it, it rains quite heavily in part of the catchment. Um, and it doesn't hit the whole catchment at once, it will rain in, in, in a particular area and it sort of track across. And as it tracks across, you'll get all the pumping stations turn on at the same time because they have relatively simple control systems on off again. Um, they will fill up and they all turn on and then you get uh, a hydraulic, uh, hydraulically overwhelmed uh, networks. So using these, these three models then, so the, the inflow, simulation of how it runs through, um, and then finally the, the one I didn't talk about was the optimizer. So the optimizer then is a particle swarm analysis for anyone that is into data science and stuff. Data, that's a data-driven approach to figure out the best combination of pumping. So is it you turn these three pumping stations on together, but actually hold some flows back at this other pumping station? Don't pump that one yet. Um, do you stagger them a bit, pump a bit here, start pump a bit there? Essentially, it's looking at the system of pumping stations as opposed to individual pumping stations. So if you can control that better, can you reduce uh, flooding, pollution, and spills? 
Um, so, so far we've seen some really promising results. So uh, initial simulations uh, have shown just by um, staggering the, the pumping of those pumping stations, we're seeing a 20% reduction in spill volume in simulations um, just through a data-driven approach. But there are some challenges. Um, when we think about what where, where this is going, what do we ultimately want to, to achieve with AOT? Well, we want to do a lot more than just uh, than just optimize the pumping stations. We want to be able to proactively uh, prepare the network. So that's completely prepare the network. That's look at asset health condition. That is look at the pumping station status. Um, we want to be able to warn our customers and get some good notifications out there. During the storm, we want to manage the whole process where the AI brain takes into account all of the status of the health of the assets, all of the customer information, and then uh, sort of real-time calibration and validation. And then post-storm, retrain the models and then um, do any remedial works required or trigger some interventions. So that's kind of where it's going. So we've seen some really good initial simulations, mainly very heavily data-driven approaches. There's a question now, how do we get it to this, to this vision? And I think that's where we're going to start looking more heavily into the, the data side of things, more heavily into uh, mechanistic models. Okay, second uh, second example. So this is uh, another off what project we've got. So um, it's the Net Zero Hub. So uh, it's it's our it's our program. It's our Net Zero program um, to create a Net Zero Emissions uh, Wastewater Treatment Works um, at one of our our largest uh, sites uh, in our in our patch. So what we've got is a big combination of physical technologies. Um, there's um, cover covering ASP lanes in order to capture N2O, um, the, 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 like greenhouse gas wind was talking about, it's about 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. It's really important to, to capture that coming out of the, the ASPs. Um, and we've got a range of other physical technologies, but really we want to know how to get the best out of these technologies together. And then we want to be able to optimize the whole site. So considering greenhouse gas emissions, energy, um, energy production and sludge production. So we've obviously got the, the water, uh, the water liquid side, and we've got the solid side as well. Um, we've got the final effluent going out into, into the river, of course. So we started to think about how could we do this using digital twin. Um, and we, at the start of the, the journey, we, we had a lot of 3D uh, stuff and we kind of go, that's great, but we really need to get it to a, a predictive analytics and simulations capability. So um, we're working with a range of partners on this as well. Uh, so some of those are Siemens, Xylem. I, I know some of them are on the call as well. Um, Siemens, Xylem. Oh gosh, what else have we got? Um, God, if I've forgotten anyone, I'll, I'll try and I'll try and shout them out later on. Um, uh, and Atkins, of course. Um, <laughs> Oliver, will tell me off for that one. Um, so um, so how are we how are we doing? That's probably the next slide. Right. So I gave you a vision for for AOT and where that's going. Time to give you a vision for, um, for, for our net zero site. Um, and it kind of works like this. So we need to know what's coming into the works. Um, so that's flow and load, and it's also additional load, could be trade waste. Um, we then need to figure out how we get it through the treatment process, but this isn't just a hydraulic process anymore. This is a biological process. So it becomes a little bit more complex. And that's why this one is, the foundation, the basis of this one is going to be a mechanistic model. So um, unlike AOT, where we went pretty much all out, we're data-driven, and now we're starting to think about how we build in mechani mechanistic models. This one, the thinking starts with mechanistic models because the mathematics, one, a lot of it's known, but two, it is so complex, we need to start with that mathematics. And then when you think about scaling as well, if we want to scale out to other, other treatment works, if it's all learned and it's all data-driven, then all you've ever learned is what's happened at that site. If it's mathematical, it's got, it's got a mathematical foundation, you can then start to apply that um, elsewhere with, with some tweaks. But of course, we want to enhance that with data-driven approaches. Um, and in a similar style, once we've optimized the processes at the works, we want to be able to um, optimize across the range of the trade-offs we talked about. We want to be able to adjust set points both, uh, both, both through our operation center, but also automatically. Um, so wouldn't it be great if we could have an automation side of this as well? So as control loops we talked about, if the digital twin could actually influence those, that would be really, really, really good. Um, 
and then um and then yeah i guess at the end we're making sure that we're meeting our consent so again customer commitments um commitments to the environment but also there's a bit about resource recovery as well which um i probably should have mentioned earlier so again as part of the, the net zero um hub and the program that we've got we're also looking to start to recover nutrients on, on the site as well so um think about all the all the tissue paper you put down the toilet so it's all it's all it's all uh, it's all recoverable the heat that comes off of these systems that's recoverable so how can we get to a place where we're recovering all of this stuff um, and then recycling it bro so quick summary i'm sure i've taken up more than my time um data quality so again going back to the, the data catalog through to analytics through to visualizing reporting alerts alerts and alarms it really requires good data and it requires good data for all of the critical assets that run your plant so we really need to know our data gaps and we're just starting to realize now how well we've realized for a while how important data is but we're just starting to realize how much of a challenge it is to actually review that and do something about it mechanistic versus data driven so i've shown you a data driven example where we're looking in the waste networks and i've shown you a mechanistic based model um, for the wastewater drink plant enhanced through data driven approaches uh insights how far can we go it didn't touch upon that at all but that will come out of the discussions i hope and uh pretty much the same with the technology stack one thing i will say on the technology stack before i finish if we go back to this slide we haven't really touched upon the technology stack so when we implement everything you see on here we forget there's a big world above it which is like the cloud so we've gone, so 7Trent have gone to Azure. Uh, we've got an Azure cloud um, platform. We do a lot of analytics uh, in, in, in that cloud platform. Um, we've got to ask ourselves, how does how does this all work with, with the cloud? Are you doing some of it locally, uh, actually at the treatment works? How are you doing a lot of it in the cloud? Is it your cloud? Do you send data out to other people's clouds? Does start to get quite complex. So again, maybe this will come out with Q&A a bit, but it's, it's another consideration that we've got. Um, is that it, it really does it really does get more complex when you think about how you implement it in, in the IT world as well as just the OT world. Oh, back to Oliver. So thank you, James. Funnily enough, on that last question, we do have are these DT cloud cloud-based or on-premise? They seem to require a mixture of plant data and external information too. So that is just what you were saying. James, yeah, absolutely. Wanna... So it's a yeah. round case. We, we we absolutely want to recognize the power of the cloud. Um, so cloud cloud based is the way we are going. Again, if you kind of want to scale up the if you want to scale up the solution. So think about it, you've got multiple sites. If you haven't got it in one cloud based location, you might find it challenging to actually have a digital twin or multiple sites all running together as one system. So we've got lots of lovely questions in the Q&A. Um, do keep on adding to them, although we probably won't get through all of them. One that Vim wants to answer, he's he's got this one uh, from William Classen. Currently, digital twins and all related modeling and data handling work happens a lot in niche software, each with their own model and data formats, uh, formats and often with a software first de design. These tools are main closed source and bring a lot of implementation headaches and actual product action context. Opening modeling ecosystems exist and, pro, uh, and progress in the digital space could significantly improve the adoption and implementation effort of digital twins, bringing time and resources to focus on the essence of the process instead of reinventing the implementation wheel each time. What is your opinion for the whole panel? on the implementation challenges and the progress in the DT space when it comes to improving the technical obstacles relating to the DT usage. Now, Vim, I think you wanted to start on that one. Yeah, it's a, I think it's an interesting question uh, by William. Um, yeah, with, with this whole digital twin transformation or digital transformation, I kind of have the feeling that separate pl platforms from the past start merging uh, gradually more and more. Uh, so scattered because each platform has strengths, right? Unique strengths and, and not a single tool can do everything. So yeah, a very interesting question. And I'm specifically interested in, um, for example, how James uh, looks at the implementation uh, as a utility from a utility perspective and also Pilar from, uh, from a software perspective. Because I, I can imagine, for example, Idrika has also been integrating softwares. Um, 
So um, yeah, maybe I, I, I will, this was my introduction, but I, I will. I think I will still start listening. <laughs> <laughs> James Pilar, do you want to have a go at that one? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yes, it's a very good question because this is one of the uh, challenges, challenging points that we have to face when implementing uh, a digital twin in our case. Uh, what we are using is an agnostic platform. So what we are doing is um, to implement uh, a platform that integrates uh, all the information that resides in the different services in the company. So once we have this platform where all the information is integrated, we connect it with hydraulic models. And regarding what software, what modeling we are using. In our case, uh, we are using open source uh, EPANET. EPANET is a standard uh, for water distribution networks, it's, it's op uh, open source. Um, most of the other uh, software, packaged okay, software, uh, can export uh, to, to EPANET because EPANET is like a, a, a reference in the industry. Most of, uh, there are uh, a huge community of researchers working on that and it is open source. So we try to be agnostic uh, and use uh, uh, open software modeling. So this is our solution. <laughs> yeah, so te technical technical challenges. It's, so we're still learning. So I, I think I have, to, I have to sort of dodge the question a bit with the we're still learning because it's it's going to be it's going to be a challenge and what i love about the off what projects that we've got going on at the moment is it gives us a chance to kind of explore as well so we are exploring some of the benefits and the challenges of each of the technical implementations that, that we're doing um and what we've got to figure out for 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 next amp really is how we're going to scale all of this out so is it is it one platform is it 10 platforms is it and then how, how many different platforms do you need across each of the data parts? So do you need a platform for data ingestion? Do you need a platform for simula simula simulations? You know, and then you've got waste, then you've got water, you've got infra, you've got non-infra. How do you connect all of that into one integrated to end-to-end -end system? So it's it's going to be, um, I think we're going to be on quite a fast learning curve with this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's also our experience. If we talk to our utility customers, uh, the whole market is in, uh, is, is in a learning stage. I will give one example. Recently, uh, a Dutch utility requested a market input um, for indeed a vision around digital twins. But in that document, they stated like people, nobody can claim right now they have the complete solution. Uh, so we invite suppliers to now write a vision document and come together. And then we will interview and we will set together a consortium to see what works best. So this is right now a little bit the stage where we are. Um, there are a couple of very big established platforms, but uh, there are still still some gaps to be filled and curious how this will unfold. Huh? Um, yeah. So at that, I've got uh, Erin reminding me there's still something to do with the poll. So Erin, do you want to bring that up? And I'm going to be really adventurous and actually ask one of the participants to answer one of the questions. Um, and Morgan, I know you're on the call because I can see you. Uh, if you could type the answer into the chat, I'll, I'll read it out. Has there been a pilot of, of, of DT in an African country, especially sub-Saharan Africa? I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure if our panelists know, but Morgan uh, from Rand Water is on the call and he's actually part of the Digital Water um, Programme uh, Steering Committee. So I'll wait to see if Morgan answers it in the chat. In the meantime, we do have um, uh, polls uh, So do answer the poll questions. Do you think there is a consensual definition of a digital twin? Um, question two, are utilities ready to adopt this technology? Less than 20% between 20 and 50, above 50%. And question three, what are the main barriers that stop the digital twin adoption? So do answer that in the poll. Our host and panelists can't vote, unfortunately. Uh, but you can actually, um, you can discuss it with this with me. Do you think there is a consensual definition of a digital twin? Bim, Pilar, James. I think, um, I think yeah. there are a lot of definitions of digital twins. Uh, but uh, I have seen like in the last year, there are a lot of working groups that have uh, made a big effort trying to have a, a, an agreed or trying to have a single uh, and, and unique uh, definition of a digital twin. 
Uh, so in the past, as I said in my presentation, uh, a Scadia was a digital twin or a BIM or a GIS <laughs> because we, we didn't know uh, what a digital twin was. And in fact, this was a concept that was introduced in the, in the industry field for optimize the, the life cycle of a product, which was introduced by Dr. Gibbs, who uh, is the father of this concept. So when we try to uh, translate uh, this concept from the industry, uh, to a city management context, context is difficult. So uh, the new, uh, the, the good news is that uh, in the last year uh, there has been uh, or there has been a lot of work trying to provide a, a, a single and a common um, definition. And I think uh, today it is. Fantastic. I'm going to quickly interject there and Morgan's come back to me. Fantastic. Thank you, Morgan. Yes, there are pilots currently happening in South Africa in both water and wastewater. Um, quick question from William Classen in the in the chat. Uh, Pilar, could you type the name of your modeling platform? Is that EPA net? So it's EPA net, EPA net. Mm -hmm. uh, learning from other communities is always interesting. I'm a fan of your agnostic approach by open source. Fantastic. Um, so I'm going to briefly answer the consensual definition of a digital twin. I'm going to say no, I don't think there is. And it also depends upon the digital twin that you mean. So what do I mean by this? Uh, digital twins, to me, there's several different types of digital twin. We've mainly been talking about the operational digital twin now, applying that to wastewater treatment works, uh, water treatment works, networks. But before that, I, you've got what I call the... Um, construction digital twin. Um, some would call it um, AutoCAD 3D on steroids, maybe. Um, and actually in the in the work that Pilar's done in, in Seville, um, sorry, Valencia, not Seville, my brain going, uh, you see some great construction models, which, yeah, they're, they're a virtual representation, which people have called a, a digital twin you certainly see in manufacturing facilities where they build a manufacturing facility digitally first, apply a instrumentation layer of how that factory is going to work in a complex system. Um, so they're dis uh, discrete construction-based digital twins, and there's lots of those examples out there. I've certainly seen, um, I'm not going to say I've, I'm old enough to remember draftsmen with onion paper and um, drawing on drawing boards, but in my years, I've seen uh, AutoCAD move to 3D AutoCAD, move to BIM for water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, it's, it, I will say it depends upon digital twin and depends what you want from it. But I'll let Vim and James answer as well. Yeah, so, um, yeah, Oliver, and it, there, there was also a comment from somebody, I think, from DHI China, and the, uh, that, that models are being used for decades already. Huh? And uh, what is now changing is just um, every model right now that is being used in a design stage or so is now suddenly a digital twin under construction. Uh, that is, uh, yeah, likely a little bit, or, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting. <laughs> so w when you take the Gartner, the Gartner hype cycle, we're very much in that inflated expectations <laughs> that everyone's calling it a digital twin, and yeah. and some, of course, we, what we've seen in in, in Valencia is we've we've come out the other end, and I'm sure during the many years of development, Pilar, and uh, I'm a big, you know, I'm a big fan you've probably gone through that stage with your, your boards and people within the organization of, oh, this is going to solve our world. It's going to be a silver bullet. Yes, no. Would that be fair to say, Pilar? Yeah. I think uh, there are some questions about uh, how we can convince the board and how um, what is the return of investment of this kind of technology. Uh, I think uh, if you have some specific challenges that you want to face and you start uh, deploying or, de or developing this digital twin, uh, focus on these objectives is going to be really uh, easy to convince the board. It's difficult that sometimes, uh, or it's difficult sometimes to, to measure the, uh, like the, 
the things that we are going to, the benefits that we are going to obtain with the digital twin, because some of them uh, can be measured in terms of money, but others not. In our case, um, I think it was, uh, we, we were really very convinced about that. Uh, because uh, having the challenge where, uh, and I think most utilities uh, happen, where the knowledge is concentrated in very few people that have been working for a long time in the utility, 30, even 40 years, and these people uh, are about to retire, uh, how to to, uh, to train the new people that join the company, how to manage an emergency condition when this, uh, this knowledge is very concentrated in some few people. So uh, having a tool that gives you the security uh, for training new people, for uh, training new people that are going to join the company, and for managing uh, all the security uh, emergency, all the emergency, uh, all the emergency situations that can happen. I think for a water utility is, is very easy to be convinced because, uh, as I said before, we have to provide water 24 hours, and we can do it very well um, for years and years. But if we do it bad one day, <laughs> really, it's a disaster. So only with one day, uh, it's going to be a disaster for the for the board. So uh, focus on the objectives in our case was the, the security and also making it uh, the, the transitional change uh, to new generations. Mm, I think uh, it, I think it was a key and uh, the board was very convinced about that. James, do you want to add? Bim, do you want to add before I start to wrap up? Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to quickly go through the discussion polls. We've got absolutely tons of questions uh, on which we can't possibly answer now because some of us have got meetings in about eight minutes time. So I'll very quickly wrap up. Discussion polls, do you think there's a consensual definition of a digital twin? 60 said yes, 57 said no. So pretty much 50-50. Are utilities ready to adopt this technology? 49% less than 20 um 20 to 50 percent was 42 percent and above 50 10 percent so really almost 90 percent is less than 50 percent main barriers insufficient technology comes in insufficient data quality absolutely vital um i certainly still multivariate process control basically fail about five years ago on that one uh what which phase of the water cycle can leverage more can leverage the Benefits digital twin more. Treatment parts distribution tr transport networks is the most. Sewage networks, but relatively little, and yet we're kind of starting to see that. And I'm certainly seeing it in treatment plants. Uh, which profiles can benefit more than this, more from this technology? The winner there was control room operators, certainly, but field operators will, everyone will basically. Uh, do you think this the mature technology is still developing? A whopping 94% said it's still growing. So absolutely, there's a lot more to go in this place space. Um, so thank you for uh, Kim, who's stayed on to 1 a.m. in Korea. That is dedication to, to the cause. Um, I really want to say thank you very much to Vim, Pilar, and James for informing us of some great, great uh, things. I think we've got a lot more to say here. Erin is quickly flicking my slides to say, do come up. I think this uh, recording is going to go on to IW, the IWA network. If you're not a member of the IWA, Carla would um, crucify me if I didn't say, you of course must join the IWA if you're not part of it. There's the International Women's Day uh, coming up on the 8th of March. So do register for that on IWA Learn. Erin's um, going to talk, talk to me about the, of course, the World Water Congress and uh, an exhibition in Toronto on the 11th to the 15th of August. Uh, flick back there for Erin for me for a second. Um, we are developing a whole digital aspect of the IWA World Water Congress in Toronto, and we're already starting to plan for the digital aspect of the World Water Congress in Glasgow in 2026. Um, sorry to be so fast, uh, but Erin, if you click forward for me. Um, join our network of IWA we webinars 24. That's a 20% discount off new membership if you're not already a member, which I know you all are. So thank you all very much for coming and uh, participating. Um, 
Really glad that so many of you have enjoyed it and I can see some great stuff in the chat. Uh, apologies that we couldn't uh, answer all the questions, but we will, I'm sure Erin will pass me the questions afterwards um, so that I can get some answers to you all. And I don't know, we'll do an article or something on it um, to answer your questions and see what we can do. So thank you very much to all our attendees. Um, thank you very much to Pilar, James and Vim. And I hope you've enjoyed it and see you soon on the next one. We will be having something on artificial intelligence in wastewater networks sometime in May, I believe it is, Erin, was it? Um, but do check out uh, LinkedIn and the IWIO websites for a lot more information. Um, thank you all.